Praise the Lord. We're starting a new book today in, a, in Philippians. I woke up this morning, and I'll share with you what the Lord said. He said, son, he said, there are a lot of stories in America about the Bible, but we need to get back to actually teaching what the Bible says. Why? Because Jesus said, my words are spirit in their life. And we can pick stories out of the Bible that are very, very nice, but they're not going to teach all of the principles of Christianity if we just pick and choose to make us feel good. There's a lot of things in the Bible that, that don't necessarily make us feel good, but they're important for us. In other words, we're children. You can't feed them what they want all the time, okay? If I was a child right now, Okay, I'd want to eat Magnum bars for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Chocolate bar with caramel in it. Okay, I probably wouldn't live to long, as long as I have lived, all right? So you just can't eat what you want to eat all the time. Magnum bars and bacon. I love bacon. It's not healthy for you, so I only have it once in a while. But it tastes so good. You know, and you can make the argument, why did God make something taste so good that's so bad for you? Mmm, temptation. I don't know. But anyhow, you know, the idea is that we need to be able to have the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God. So anyhow, in this vision this morning I had, what's a vision? It's just your mind starts to kind of like drift into this place where you're thinking. And Lord said, compare the, the teachings of the uh, early church and also of the, uh, the preachers that preached in the 1800s, 1900s, which were very doctrinal. And then he said this, he said, it was a policy of every single church to make sure in one year's time they got through all the basic doctrines of the faith. They just didn't talk about every sermon, you know, every, every Sunday coming up with a sermon to try to convince you that your best life would be now or the best thing is going to happen to you, the best is yet to come. Which, these are true statements. But what it is, is it gives you a false hope to deal with the real issues that you have in your life every single day. So therefore, it's kind of like eating ice cream every single Sunday, and you think that you're not going to get unhealthy. We need the true word of God. Amen? Amen. So that's why we read, try to read a chapter. If we can't finish it, we will, we will uh, pick it up next week. But we're starting the book of Philippians. And again, this is Paul speaking in, uh, the, uh, to the church of Philippians, and we're going to deal with uh, verses 1 through 14, if we can get to it. But verses 1 to 7, first, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. I was thinking about that. Bondservants. They didn't even, Paul didn't even say, I'm an apostle. All the places he said he was an apostle. But here he's a bondservant. I mean, how many individuals today, including myself, go around saying, hi, I'm a, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Or be willing to say I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, which brings up all kinds of bad feelings in people today. That's exactly what Paul was saying. I'm a bond servant. I'm a willing servant of Jesus Christ. I serve him and not myself. In other words, the other part of the vision I had this morning is, is Lord son, said, son, sometimes we as preachers allow our personalities more exposure than the word of God. In other words, our personalities can be so strong and so charismatic that people are are actually getting entertained by our personality rather than by the words that we're necessarily speaking. Now, it's impossible to separate personality and the words that you speak, but sometimes we become more like Hollywood actors or individuals that are trying to entertain with our personality or with our isms and things like that than letting the word of God just come forth. Why? Because the word of God in itself, when you read it, it's not necessarily just going to say all nice things all the time. It's going to deal with the problems of your humanity. It's going to deal with the problems of your flesh. It's going to deal with the problems of your relationships. It's just going to hit you straight on. So let's read it and we'll see some things here. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Bishop there is called elders, okay, presbytery and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in 
every prayer of mine making request for you in, with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Two nuggets here that we find. Number one, again, Paul always is speaking about grace. And grace, it's more than just unmerited favor. Grace is what keeps us going. Grace is what keeps us from feeling condemned because we fail so much in life down here. Grace tells us that he's able to keep that which we've entrusted unto him until the day he comes back. And grace does this thing. It tells us every single day that God began a work in us if we accepted him as Lord and Savior and we asked for forgiveness for our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That process is going to continue on until we see Jesus. You will never be perfect in this life. Let me say that again. You will never be perfect in this life. Someone once brought up, yeah, there's a scripture though in King James says, be ye perfect just as your father is having a perfect attitude. You can't be perfect and sinless. That's not what the word means. It just means our attitude should be one of perfection in the sense that we are always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. So the perfect attitude is that I will allow God's work to continue to work in me. This is what Paul is saying. And it's done by his grace. The devil always comes around when we fail, we have personal failures, or we have a, you know, something just is not working out in our lives, and we're thinking we did it and God's left us. God never leaves you nor forsakes you. That's why it's important to read the Word of God. The more you understand of the Word of God and lessen, uh, uh, listen less, to just voices on the radio, on the internet, or the media, the more you will hear the Spirit speaking. Why? It's because in America especially, we want to be able to speak words that are going to encourage people, but yet at the same time, in doing that, we're doing basically what motivational speakers do all the time. Let me give an example. When Jess and I went down to Florida to visit her aunt and also my sister, um, Jess, I got up early and I, I wanted to take a walk. And it was nice down there. So I took a walk and I, I saw a bookstore. So I went in a bookstore. And this, this is the problem with American Christianity. If we're going to say there's any kind of a problem where you need to shift back to the word, it's in this. The first thing you do when you walk into a bookstore, they have usually a massive shelf of self-help books, motivational stuff, you know. Things like, um, you know, how to succeed in life and how to be successful in business, how to, how to do this, how to do this, how to do this, or you're, you know, this is how you're going to do this, this is the way you're going to do this, this is the way you're going to do this. Now, that's the secular version. Then you go to the, the Christian version, uh, the Christian shelf, and it's very small today compared to all the rest of the self-help books. When you go there, it's the same thing by Christian authors. And yet, very little of it has to do with the idea of changing your life. In other words, allowing the Spirit of God to mold you and make you into His image and likeness rather than you having a preacher mold you into the image and likeness of who you think you want to be. That is an issue that you need to deal with. Because if you just want somebody to tickle your ears to make you feel better, well then you're not going to take on the image of Jesus Christ because the image of Jesus Christ in my heart and mind is one who died on the cross, shed his blood, and he resurrected from the dead. So therefore, my Jesus tells me, you cannot be my disciple unless you're willing to deny yourself first. Take up your cross daily and follow after me. That's the process of sanctification. But you can't even do that by yourself. You need the grace of God, amen? amen. And that's why Paul said here, in verse seven, just that it is right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers with me of what? How does it finish it in verse 7? Of, of grace. 
Grace. There you go. Of grace, the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. But at the same time, I've got to do something more than just go ahead and proclaim, well, it's God's doing whatever he wants to do in my life. There's something that I need to do. And the Bible's explicit about the idea of learning how to deny yourself. Why would we have to deny ourselves? What, what, do we, what do we deny ourselves of? If you're not willing to first deny yourself and take up your cross daily. I mean, what do I have to deny? If you need to ask the question, okay, and I'm just saying it rhetorically, then you really got an issue. Because if you don't think that Christianity is a place where you have to deny yourself, okay, then you really don't know the basics of what the Word of God says. The Bible says that the Scriptures teach us to, okay, forsake worldliness. John said it this way. He just summarized it up. Love not the world, nor the things in the world. For the things in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. This is not of the Father, and the form of this world is passing away. That's in contradistinction to many of the messages that are speaking today about your best life now. Because to have your best life now, I can guarantee you, it's not necessarily serving Jesus Christ if you're looking at success the way the world has it. Because your best life now, if you want to be a billionaire, is follow the, atheist, the atheism of Bill Gates or many of the other billionaires that are atheists today. And they're humanitarians. They do nice things. <clears throat> they, uh, you know, they, they're willing to give away <clears throat> all of their millions of dollars when they go, all their billions of dollars to charity. That's a wonderful thing. doesn't get you into heaven, but it's a wonderful thing. But your best life now is really to say, Jesus, what do you want me to be? Your best life and successful in Christ is to say, Lord, I am willing to deny myself first. Take up my cross and follow after you. How do you do that? Step one, get along with God. Have a meeting with your creator. Even if you are a Christian, take a step back. It's going to be nice weather maybe tomorrow or whatever. I mean, I could do this in the mall. I can do it in my car. I can do it anywhere. But the point is that when it's nice weather, take a step back and get along with God on a beach somewhere. Just walk in the beach or go to a park and say, God, I want to talk to you as my father. How am I doing in your sight? Ask yourself the question, though, when was the last time that I ever do this? Father, how am I doing? I remember Mayor Koch used to say that all the time. How am I doing? I liked Mayor Koch. I, I, I really did. I mean, he was very conscientious about what he was doing. I didn't agree with his political positions, but I... I don't, I don't, I don't, like I just got done telling you, I don't dislike people because they have a different political position for me. I can still like somebody, go to lunch with them, and be friends with someone. Just because I have a difference of opinion. My gosh, if you're going to hang around with only people that are going to end up having the exact same opinion as you, don't ask me to be your friend, okay? Because I'm not going to have a good time. I'm going to be like a bunch of parrots, okay? If I want parrots, I'll go buy them in the store. I want to be with people that have different opinions so I can listen and I can learn. Why do you think the way you think? Maybe I can add to them. Maybe they can add to me. Not only in Christianity, but also in the things of the world to understand why, why do you think the way you are. It can help sharpen my reasons for being a Christian. If I can understand the faultiness of the logic and the reasoning of other individuals. But you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. We've got to be listeners. It's the way you change. I shared this probably many times. When I first got saved, I was one of the most selfish individuals. I was just a good businessman. That's all. Me first. My family, of course, but me first. I could never think of working for a low wage. If I was going to study to do something, I said, you know what? I want to make $100 an hour. That was back then. That's like three, $400 an hour now. Why? Oh, simple logic and reasoning. Why work for $10 an hour 
for $120, $130 a day when I can work like one third of an hour and make $300 an hour. You know what I'm saying? I can make $100 in 15 minutes. Lawyers do that. Some of them make even more than that. $300, $400 an hour. That's nice money. I mean, it, it beats going to college for seven years and getting a doctorate degree in a field where you can't even get a job. So you gotta, you know, work is, you know, school is school. So what's the difference? I gotta study this, I gotta study that. Now if you, I, I'm putting a plug for computer engineering because there's a demand for computer engineers. Big, big uh, demand for that. Maths and sciences and physics and things like that. Not such a demand for archaeologists or his, history majors, okay, with doctorate degrees. You don't have to work in a, and, and believe me, these places you're not going to find jobs today because there's very few. In fact, they're closing down a lot of the particular religious departments of most secular colleges. I know that for a fact because I study these things. I'm always curious what's going on in the educational system. Even history, they're kind of like, you know, it's, it's like a necessary evil to some of them to teach history. You know, what for? We don't need that today. Kids don't want to learn it, and uh, we don't have, you know, there's no money in it anyhow. Computer engineering, yeah. Biomedical sciences, yeah, major in that, guarantee you're going to get a good job in that. Okay? That's, that's where college is going to do. Most of the other ones are, eh, nothing. Okay, you'll spend $130,000 getting a degree from a named university, you find yourself driving a cab, or becoming an Uber driver, or Uber, or Uber, how do you say, Uber? Uber. Uber driver, okay? with a master's degree, okay? And um, yeah, you can talk about what you learned to the, everyone you're driving around, whether or not they care about it, and I don't know. But the point is, we can focus on a lot of different things that are just absolutely worthless when it comes to the future. We can just be majoring in minor areas. But realize this, that you have a devil, you have an enemy. Lucifer is always trying to distract you from the very things that are most important in your life. It's like the man who works 90,000 hours a week and he comes home and his kids just want to spend some time with him. He goes, look, I, I'm doing this for you. And the kid goes, you're doing it for me. Now, the kid doesn't understand that there's a lot of bills, okay, and that they overexpended and they got house payments, they got car payments, they got this payment and that payment. So the man just justifies it by saying, you know, I'm doing this for you. And meanwhile, the kid says, I don't care about this time. And maybe you saw the commercial one time where it was really something. It was one of these uh, public announcements where uh, this little kid goes up to his father, who's really busy all the time. He goes, Dad, how much do you make an hour? What are you asking that for? And then the little kid says, well, is this enough to buy some of your time? Maybe I could buy an hour of your time. That's all it was, it was a 20 second commercial, but you get the point. Be careful that we get, don't get our lives so wrapped up in either culture or either what the world says we should be doing or what the world is doing or what your friends are doing that we forget this is a whole idea from the word of God to live as a Christian with a Christian mindset that points us upward like Hermini was saying, My, I'm focusing on Jesus. It's the only way to really get you through life. When you're young and you're not married and incumbent, incumbent by, you know, bills and things like that, I'm not trying to downplay marriage and, and house payments and car payments, but every one of us thinks about it and go, oh my gosh, you're right. It, it, it's a lot. And then the kids come and, you know, the I don't even tell you what the average price for a kid to get them through uh, 21 years old and four years of college, but it's over. It's over $750,000. That's what they're saying now, to raise a kid. So how am I going to afford that? Well, in God, God works these things out. But when you look at the number, you're going, my gosh. Are you kidding me? That's more money that I got in my IRA when I retire. And each kid. And I think of any man. His mother and father had 14 kids. No wonder he, he, the guy's a very successful businessman, but uh, 14 children. And you look at and, and Vinny's mom, and she looks like she's very thin, and she looks young. You know, I don't know how she gave birth to 14 babies. Are you sure, Vinny? <laughs> Praise God. I'm only joking. But he comes from a wonderful family. Hard-working father and mother loves all the kids. Uh, but I tell you, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. But still, even with all of these things, we still be focusing on God. And let me tell you how you do that. It's very simple. It's a very simple thing to be able to keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Awaken the dawn every morning and talk 
to Jesus. You don't have to talk for five hours. Let him know you're there. Say, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me this day. Read a few scriptures. Just read them. Read a chapter. It doesn't take more than a minute. And then reflect on it. Say, Holy Spirit, during the day, teach me something about it. Why? Because his, these words are alive. They're not, they're not just like a history book. They're alive. The Holy Spirit wrote them. And the more of them you get into your mind and heart, the more the Holy Spirit can guide your life during the day. Because we're distracted so much in New York. So much distraction here. We're distracted by so many different things, too. I found even shutting off the TV. I don't watch TV. I haven't watched it in like two and a half years. Um, I just don't watch it. Once in a while, if, if I can see an old movie or something like that that has godly values, Jess and I will sit down and watch it. But I'm not into that. Now, I don't stop the kids from watching the movie except for the garbage. I don't want them watching it. Okay, But this is me, and I wouldn't stop you from doing it. I'm just saying for me, my own life, it really opened myself up to be able to hear the Holy Spirit speaking through the scriptures more. Why? Because just about everything you see from Hollywood on the media today, the arguing of political positions and uh, Facebook and all these other things like that. And I still look at Facebook every day, but I'm getting to the place where I, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, try, I'm, I'm sick of trying to filter out what seems to be questionable, you know, because everybody you know, posits these these things or they're passing it on from somebody else and nobody's researching to find out if it's really truth or not. It's really hard to tell. I'm not talking about my friends. I'm talking about the stuff that you just see on your news feeds. It's getting distracting to the place where if you pick that stuff up and assume it's true and it's not true and you pass it on to somebody else, you're gossiping and you're passing lies. Did you ever think of that? That's what the devil wants you to do. Now, don't feel condemned over it, but the fact is it's very difficult to filter truth through the media today. Where can you filter truth? The word of God. Which leads me back to this because we got to finish up. I want to read the second part of this. Philippians chapter uh, 1 verses 8 to 14. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in, the, in knowledge and in all discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent. And that's what I'm talking about. You have no problems by reading the word of God. You already know that's excellent. You don't have to worry about going to spell check. Well, not spell check, but fact checked, okay? You don't have to go to the fact check. If the word of God says it, then the word of God is the word of God. You don't have to worry about, gee, I wonder if this is true or not. Thy word is truth, the Bible says in the middle of Psalm uh, 150, okay? I'm not Psalm, uh, in, in, in Psalm 119, which is in the middle of the Bible. That's why it's easy to just flip your Bible open to the middle. Usually Psalm, Psalm 119 is in the middle. The sum of thy word is truth. I kind of like that illustration. I don't think he set it up that way, but it's a nice way to look it for it. Psalm 119, by the way, is a great, great psalm to read. If you read it, I can guarantee you'll say, this guy loved the word of God. The whole psalm is about how the, how the psalmist loved the truth. He lived for truth. Not for what he wanted to hear but he lived for the truth. Because when you know the truth, which is not necessarily the, your opinion, it's not necessarily what you think, it's the truth, you line your life up and it says, uh-oh, I, I need to adjust to this. Okay, it's like I see a compass right before me because I, I love boats, okay? I don't have one now in water, but I got one in my backyard. I've been working on trying to rebuild this thing. And um, for four years it's been back there. It needs a lot of work, but you know, I think about a compass, and you can fight with a compass all you want to, but the compass is going to point towards north. And you can say, I don't like that. I'm going here. And the compass is not going to say, oh, okay, you win. No, the compass is just going to point north, magnetic north, and that's it. Your reference point never changes, but your direction can change. But you don't know where you're going if you don't have a reference point. The reference point is the word of God. The Bible says that God dwells in the sides of the north, the city of the great king in the psalm says that. So therefore, this is the reference point. So we can approve things that are excellent, be filled, verse 11, with the fruits of righteousness that are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me 
have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. That's another nugget. In other words, he's in chains. He's under palace guard. By the way, he's going to die there too in the persecutions. But right now, he's still alive. And he's saying, even though I'm in chains, it's worked out for the furtherance of the gospel. Ask yourself, how many of you can say that in your trial and tribulation that you can come afterwards and say, you know what? It worked out for good anyhow. God causes everything to work together for good. You just got to wait long enough to see that. He causes everything to work to, together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But you got to wait. If you wait on the Lord, the Bible says you renew your strength, you will mount up with wings. What? As the eagles. In other words, you'll be able to fly. And eagles are great because in storms, all other birds kind of like are, are looking for cover. Eagles are majestic birds. They're used to the mountaintops and the trees. When a storm comes, you know what eagles like to do? They don't cower. They fly above the clouds. They have great eyesight from a very high distance. They can look spot, but they love to soar. They love the winds. They're not afraid of them. They love them. Less energy. It's a lot less energy when you let the wind of God guide your life than you try to go ahead and crawl through your flesh life. Don't argue with flesh. Speak the word with a smile. You'll always win if you stay out of the mud puddle. Because when you jump in a mud puddle, and what's a mud puddle of argument? That's what they are. People are throwing mud at each other and arguments about something. You jump in there because you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put an end to this argument. Don't, don't you realize you just jumped in the mud and you're full of mud too? The way to be able to not get mud on you is don't jump in. And recognize this, that most of what's going on is nothing but emotional arguments that are void of true reason and logic, filled with lies. That's what's going on in society today. But you will never have a problem with the word of God because God's word is truth. It will give strength to your spirit. And the Holy Spirit will teach you every day, don't walk there, don't go there, don't, don't enter into that argument, don't criticize that person that's trying to set you up, you see. The devil's always trying to set you up to get you in the flesh. And you gotta be smart enough to realize, you know what, I'm not gonna answer flesh. I'm not gonna be drawn into an emotional argument because emotions are insane. They're not reasonable at all. They, they don't care about reason at all, but we need them. But we don't, we don't, we have to realize that emotions do not have any kind of logic and reasoning in them whatsoever. And if you're run by emotions, you're gonna be running over everybody with your life. And you don't want to do that. Amen? Let's finish this up here. So, being filled, verse 11, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the praise, uh, the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, in verse 12, actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. See, Paul was willing to wait because he knew that everything was going to work together for good. He was going to wait until the end of the tunnel before he made a judgment call. In other words, wait till the end of the tunnel. End of tunnels, you see light, you go, ha, the tunnel's over. In the middle of the tunnel, tunnel, they can be so long, you're going, when am I going to get out of this? And I'm talking metaphorically, because some of you are in tunnels right now where you just don't know. You just don't know how it's going to end up. But I can guarantee you, at the end of the tunnel, there's light. Okay? It's always there. So it turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. In what, in what way? Well, Paul is an apostle. He says in verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard, not a few, but the whole palace guard, and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for the word of God, and we thank you for Philippians. The two major points we learned, Lord Jesus, today, Lord God, that you have begun something in our lives, and you're going to continue that work until the day when we see you, Jesus. And also, Lord God, we also know, Lord God, everything that happens to us, Father God, it turns out for the good eventually. And we've got to wait, Lord God. The eventually can take a long time, but God, we put our faith and our trust in you. So Lord, we pray for every family represented here, here, that your grace, your goodness, and your mercy would be upon them. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone says, amen.